This week, we're going to be discussing leadership. What is leadership? Um, <laughs> that is a question that has been discussed a great deal within management and other related fields. And I think it's a hard question to answer. Um, in fact, Plato will look mostly this week at Plato's dialogue, The Statesman. And he's not really thinking about what leadership is. He's thinking about what good leadership is and thinks that's an easier question to answer um, and a more interesting question to answer. I tend to agree with that. But let's start with some conception of just what leadership is. How would you define leader? Yeah. Ah, OK. So you might say, wait, first of all, a leader has to have a certain amount of competence. Now, why do you say that? Ah, OK. If somebody's incompetent, are they going to be a lead? Well, certainly we have to separate this question of what is a leader from what is a good leader. Yeah. But, <laughs> but still, if somebody's incompetent enough, you might think, they can't lead at all. It's not that they'll lead badly. Why would anyone follow them? So it requires at least some degree of competence, um, even if it's an evil competence, right? At least they have to be good enough at something to get people to follow. And then you mentioned charisma. Again, right, because the underlying thought is you can't lead unless somebody follows. How could I lead if nobody follows? I mean, somebody could try to. I could say, I will now. Oh, lemmings, let me lead you over the cliff. <laughs> and if nobody follows me, then am I really a leader? So something is required that's actually going to produce followers. Are there other things you might say about what leadership is? Yeah. Some sort of vision of what needs to be followed? OK. What George H.W. Bush called the vision thing. OK. Now, why would that be important to leadership? People want to know where they're going. They want to know where they're going, exactly. If you say, I will lead you, you say, where? <laughs> right? That's an important question. Um, all too often, people try to lead without articulating any vision of where they want to lead people. Um, and it's not just US presidents who have sometimes done that. I've been parts of organizations where the leader was just completely unclear about what the direction was. And that can be very frustrating for people. And it ends up making you think, wait a minute, how can this person lead? None of us know where we're going. And so the result of that often is people are, let's say they try to follow, they have no idea what direction to go because they don't know where the person is trying to lead them. So the result is often that people mill about rather aimlessly. Um, you could say, well, that's leadership. It's just bad leadership. But another way to look at it is it's not really leading at all. There's nobody following. People are just wandering around. Even if they're trying to follow, they can't do it. Are there other things we might say about leadership? Like the basics of leadership? Like well, what do you mean by the basics of leadership? Well, because like a good leader would also like have some sort of like empathy or like do what like like I think like what George Washington said he would always go into battle like with his men because he wants to be seen kind of as not as equal but like has more Ooh. to do what they're doing. Right. Good. 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 Yeah. Again, you have to inspire people to follow, right? And so one way to do that is to actually go into battle with the troops. One way to do that is to actually inspire people. One way to do it is to actually, um, yeah, exhibit the kinds of traits that people will want to imitate. So there are various techniques, but you might say, in general, inspiration. You have to actually motivate people, right? So inspiring people, motivating people, those things seem important to leadership. It, how can I lead at all, let alone lead well, if I'm so boring, for example, <laughs> that I don't motivate anyone or inspire anyone to do anything? You know? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, actually, I've, I've been in organizations like that, too, where the leaders were simply boring. It was very dull. 
You have the big meeting at the beginning of the year that's going to inspire you to your efforts for the entire year. And it's just dull. They don't say anything. And it's just unintelligible. And you think, well, that's not going to motivate anyone. I think I've mentioned to you the speech I got on one such occasion. It said, our watchword for this year is implementation. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that didn't inspire anyone. So you could say that's bad leadership, but you could also just say that wasn't leading anyone anywhere. That was just boring everything. OK, now I want us to think about what it is to be a good boss. <laughs> Eventually, you're going to probably end up working for someone. Now, maybe not. Maybe you'll be unemployed, but <laughs> maybe you will start your own company and you'll be your own boss. But most people end up working for someone. And having somebody who is supervising them. What makes somebody a good boss, a good supervisor? Because presumably that person, in order to do that well, is going to lead. But now, what are the features of good leadership? So let's start small. Just think, what are the qualities you would want in a boss? Yeah? Effective communication. Good. You'd want effective communication. You'd want somebody who can actually not only explain the vision, <laughs> but also just explain what is expected of you. Sometimes it's very clear what people are expected to do. Sometimes it's really unclear. And it's very hard to have people follow, again, if it's unclear what direction they're supposed to go or what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah? Uh, familiar with the tasks themselves, like they experienced it rather than just um, tell, telling you what they assume is best? Ah, OK. Familiarity with tasks. Now, as people rise in an organization, that becomes more and more difficult. Because after all, you can't expect the CEO of a large corporation to actually know exactly how to do the jobs, <laughs> the thousands of jobs that might be underneath that position. But still, you would want your immediate supervisor to have some idea, enough idea of what you are actually doing that they can give you solid direction. Now, sometimes that can be tricky. Because it might be that the person in that position, let's say you're an engineer, and the person in that position has a business background. They don't know much engineering. They may not know, actually, how to make the software do what they want it to do. Um, but, and so they may be relying on you for your detailed expertise there. But usually, it's helpful to have somebody who actually knows enough about your job to give you specific direction. Yeah? Uh, trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. Good. <laughs> good, good. You have to be able to trust your boss. Um, I have worked with lots of people that I, I've been able to trust. They were solid. I could trust that they were going to keep their word and so on. But I've worked for other people I couldn't trust at all. Um, I couldn't trust their word. And actually, I've learned in dealing with university administrators that, um, and also with editors, in publishing, <laughs> never trust them, never trust them. Um, <laughs> and it's not because of the individual being untrustworthy. It's because there's too great a likelihood that they're going to be replaced with someone else who will either not remember or will not care what commitments the previous person made. Um, in publishing now, it's become horrible. It used to be you would have a vision for a book. It might take you a couple of years to write it and then a year of production. So it might be a three-year process between your vision and then actually the book coming out in print. And you would have one editor throughout all of that. You'd have a relationship with the editor. And these people were trustworthy. It's not that bad people were in publishing. But now, on a project that, length, that lasts that long, you're likely to have three or four different editors. And each one comes along. And they, they don't know what's been said to the previous editor, because they, they're often moving from some other branch of the company, so they don't know anything about philosophy, for example. And so whatever commitments were made before, they're largely unaware of, and they don't care if you make them aware of it. Similarly, the agreement you made with the old dean, new dean comes along, they're like, well, did you have it in writing? <laughs> if the answer is no, or if it's, well, yes, but that was five years ago, and my highly efficient staff threw away the files, <laughs> then boom, it's gone. Um, in my own case, some crucial commitments were made before we all had computers. 
And then once it's like, it's not on the computer. Well, yeah, we used to actually like have file folders and <laughs> paperwork, you know, and, and it was made like that. And there were memos. It's like, well, well I don't have a copy of those memos. And, oh. <laughs> Anyway, and then I went to the staff and said, you have a copy of those memos, right, from eight years ago? And the answer was, no. <laughs> uh, we threw them all away. I, t I always, well, this is why my house looks the way it does. I always tell people, don't throw anything like that away. They're using, you know, in 316, there are those blackboards, and they shake when you write on them. Why? Because if you move them, there are bookshelves behind them. And now there's nothing useful in those bookshelves. But it used to be that every college catalog and course schedule since 1947 was behind there. The whole 10 years I was chairman, that's what was behind there. And you could go and you could say, gee, what courses was the philosophy department offering in the fall of 1951? And you could find out. I cared about that. <laughs> but after I was chairman, nobody cared about that. So all that stuff is gone. And of course, none of it's computerized. It's all just gone. Um, so it makes me very sad. Some of you should be history majors and work to preserve things like this. <laughs> museum anyway, never mind. But point is, yes, individuals should be trustworthy. But also, the point of these rambling reflections <laughs> is that you need trustworthiness in the organization attached to the position as well as attached to the person. Because often, no individual is going to betray you. But if there's enough movement in the organization, a different person comes in, they may or may not recognize the commitments of the previous person in that job. So there are two dimensions of this trustworthiness of the individual person, but then how, how much can you trust that the person in that job a year from now will actually you know, have the same concerns, honor the same commitments, uh, espouse the same values, lead in the same direction? Other things you would want, the good boss, yeah. Good, being a respectable person. It is pretty hard to lead people if you don't get people's respect. Now, one way to get their respect, of course, is to have charisma. One way is to exhibit competence. One way is to articulate a vision those people believe in. One way is to be inspiring, be motivating. But in general, you have to get people's respect. You have to get them to listen to you and take seriously what you say. And you can imagine bosses that aren't like that that you don't respect. You think maybe they're incompetent, or that they're nasty people, or that they're just ridiculous people. And that's going to make it very hard for them to be an effective leader. Other things. You've got to have an eye for the observer, so you're not, you're not assigning things that seem frustrating or meaningless or counterproductive. Ah, OK, yes. So <laughs> how do we put that in a positive way? Um, have an understanding of this position. Well, maybe that is it. It's, you have to have enough of an understanding of <laughs> the boss has to understand the boss's position, also has to understand enough about your position to give you directions that make sense. And it is easy for people to end up not doing this um, if they don't have an understanding of what their roles are and what your role is. So sometimes people demand the impossible because they don't understand what's actually involved in doing the job. And so to actually have reasonable expectations, to have an understanding enough of what your role is supposed to be and what it would be to do it well, that they can actually evaluate you fairly and give you reasonable direction, all of that's very good. Um, and sometimes people don't do this. Uh, sometimes, for example, uh, a chairman around here gets a directive that they need they need some 20 to 30, or <laughs> in one case, I can think of even a 100-page report. And it has to be due to, it has to be turned in tomorrow. And you might think, wait, what? Right? Now, you know what happens in the philosophy department when we get a directive like that? People make me do it. <laughs> because it's like 20 pages by tomorrow morning, no problem. I can do that. <laughs> I, I'm the sort of person who can sit down and write I don't know, I wrote an 80-page dissertation chapter in a weekend uh, when I was a grad student. And that's not because there was a deadline. It's just like, that's what I do. I just think about things, and then I just. So I can do that. But almost nobody else can do that. And it's not that 
By the way, I mean, it's not, I'm not claiming brilliance for what I do, <laughs> but I can do that. Um, but most people look at that and say, well, that's just a completely unreasonable request. If I, if I were, for example, to say, hey, um, you know, I've, I've been forgetting to mention there is a term paper to this course, at least 20 pages, <laughs> right? Uh, you would say, wait, what? Oh, yeah, it's due tomorrow. Um, you'd think that was insane. Um, that betrays an inadequate understanding of things. I did have a professor in college who did that to us. Um, they just sprang it on us on the last class day. Oh, by the way, you all know there's a term paper for this class, right? What? <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah? Um, observant, aware of the people <laughs> Good. To be observant. Um, to be aware of what's happening. One way to be a really bad boss is just not to be paying attention, not to be aware of what's going on um, in that work group, in that organization, and so on. So there's both an internal awareness among, you know, <laughs> be aware of the situation of the people you're leading, but also be aware of the larger context, um, an outward directed awareness. And I think you're right, both of those are very important to successful leadership. Other things, yeah. So I think knowing that the environment is changing and also that employees may have inputs that you don't have and being able to accept those and work that in with everything. Okay, good. There is a situation <laughs> stressed by Boyd and actually by Sun Tzu as well as by Bay that the situation that you're dealing with is often highly dynamic and you have to have somebody who has, who is both dynamic in personality but also is capable of changing with, uh, and adapt to circumstances. They have to have the flexibility to do with, deal with new situations, and they have to be able to <laughs> um, respond in reasonable ways to new information and new circumstances. And so that's a tough thing. Um, a good example of a bad boss here would be somebody who, hey, we've just always done it this way, we're always gonna do it this way, no matter what has happening around them, no matter what the situation is doing. Yeah. Uh, like having a balance between like leadership knowing that we need to maximize shareholder value, but at the same time keep our employees happy, like having that balance between the bottom line and also employees. Ooh, good. That's a very platonic thought. <laughs> you have to balance a lot of different goals. You've got to keep, for example, in a for-profit company, your shareholders getting a return that is sufficient to make them happy. But you also have to be concerned with the happiness of your employees. You have to be concerned with the happiness of your customers. You have to be concerned with the competition and staying ahead of the competition. And all of those things are, you know, sometimes hard to balance against one another. A lot of times they work in harmony. Happy employees are gonna do a better job and they're going to make the customers happier and make you more competitive and therefore make the shareholders happier and all of that. But sometimes it may be that the only way you can get that project to the market in time is to really work your people hard. They're gonna be miserable for a few months as they work very hard on that. And so sometimes you really have to balance some, what, some of those goals against other goals. As we'll see, Plato thinks that's absolutely crucial. Being able to achieve the right kind of balance, being able to understand how various kinds of considerations get woven together into something that really is successful overall. What are some other features of good bosses? Yeah? Decisive. Good, we want somebody who's decisive. Someone who actually can choose a direction and lead people in that. Um, obviously, someone can decide so quickly that it doesn't seem well considered. But think of this as a virtue where the person makes a reasonable decision, acts on it, and doesn't delay. Um, sometimes people in a position of leadership don't do it very effectively because they're indecisive. They can't really decide what to do. And that means they don't really set a direction, means that people under them have no idea what to do. What are some other characteristics? Yeah? Well, right, so they let you know what's going on, they don't keep it a secret. 
I mean, unless it's maybe something major like, oh, we're about to go bankrupt. But you know, in general, they kind of let you know what the company's doing. But... The, yeah, OK, good. To be forthright. To be, at least to some degree, transparent. Um, I do think that's really important. It may be, and in fact, often it is in a complex organization, that the person in a position of leadership cannot fully share everything. There may be all sorts of confidential information they're aware of um, that they are legally prohibited from letting other people know. Nevertheless, <clears throat> they want, maybe I could put it this way, how can I inspire you to follow me if I'm not clear enough about what our goal is <laughs> and what my understanding is for you to share that understanding and share that goal and go in that direction. Um, I've worked for people who were not very forthright like this, who did not make it very clear what the goal was. And it leads to, well, what does happen if somebody doesn't do this? They try to lead, but actually they, they keep their own cards very carefully hidden. And you don't know what their intentions are. You don't know what direction they want to go in. Um, you get the sense, in fact, they're carefully trying to conceal that from you. Yeah? Everybody has played meta chefs where they're trying to figure out what the boss wants, but what he's really thinking, and how you can really benefit from what he really is thinking. That's right. Everybody's playing this meta game of trying to understand what the boss is really thinking. Well, what is really going on here? And so everybody's guessing differently. And first of all, that leads to a lot of confusion. But secondly, it leads to a lot of unproductive time, right, that people are spending trying to figure out what's going on. Often they come to very different conclusions. And so I found that in practice that leads to division because people can't just say, okay, there's the, there's the direction. Are you on board with it or not? Instead, people are guessing different things. And some people are going to guess the worst. Some people are going to guess the best. You get all these artificial divisions that aren't real divisions about the direction of things simply because people are making wrong guesses. They're, they're not going to say, uh, who knows what the boss wants, whatever they're going to actually try to figure it out. And they'll come to different conclusions, and so you're going to get a lot of conflict that doesn't need to be there. Anything else? <clears throat> yeah? Being visible, like knowing that a boss is present, not necessarily like... Ah, being visible, yeah. There are certain bosses that are highly visible in the sense that they're often talking to their people, um, and they're often communicating. Other bosses hardly ever interact with people. Um, in fact, in some organizations, the top management is on a separate floor. I know of a company that did that. It used to be that the people who were managing a division, for example, were there with their division. And so they were in the same area. They were walking through the same halls. They interacted with their people all the time. Then someone got the bright idea, oh no, the president and all the vice presidents and the top directors and so on should all be on their own floor. And access to that floor should be limited. Well, all of a sudden, the director of finance isn't interacting with any of the finance people. The vice president of blah, blah, blah is not interacting with all the people of blah, blah, blah. It's a very dangerous setup because all of a sudden, there isn't much visibility. And why does that matter? Who cares whether you see the vice president who you're reporting to or who your boss reports to? Why does it matter? Well, right, if, if you're not seeing them, they're not seeing you, <laughs> and you're being evaluated by these people, so that's scary. What else goes wrong here? Yeah. They don't know what's going on in your department. They don't know what's going on anymore, but that's right. So they're making decisions without much information. You end up feeling like, I don't have any input because nobody knows what I'm thinking or facing. Nobody knows what I'm doing. Nobody cares. So it communicates a kind of lack of concern. Um, and it makes it very hard for people to communicate effectively if they're just invisible and not communicating at all. So that causes a lot of problems. All right, well, obviously a bad boss would be somebody who lacks these, right? Who is an ineffective communicator, who is unfamiliar with the tasks, who is not trustworthy, who is not respectable, who doesn't understand what's going on, who doesn't observe, is inflexible, um, can't balance goals, is indecisive, is not forthright, quite secretive, is largely invisible. But are there other features of bad bosses? So we might say, look, to be a bad boss, <laughs> well, yeah, the opposite of these. But sometimes there are other things. Plus what? Yeah. Uh, lazy. OK, good. Lazy. 
might be that the boss is just like doing nothing, right? And that's going to be a problem. You might think, wait, why do I have to work hard when the boss isn't doing anything? You know, you're expected to stay until 6.30, 7 o'clock every night, but the boss leaves by 4.30. That's going to cause problems. <laughs> what else? Yeah. Having favorites. Oh, good. Playing favorites. Yeah. The boss loves certain people. Other people forget it. Oh, yes. We were going to have an across-the-board raise, but I've canceled that. Instead, most of you are getting nothing, but a few of my close friends are getting large raises. Okay, I've seen organizations where that's happened. Or in one case, the boss got a large sum of money because the division had done so well that he could apportion among the employees. He kept it all himself. He gave himself a large bonus. That's, that's really, so he was his own favorite. He's like, I have one favorite employee, me. <laughs> yeah. Are they actually lazy or are they just an effective delegator? Ooh, okay, good. Ineffective delegator. There are people who are bad at delegating tasks. And there are different ways of doing it. Maybe they delegate too much and they don't do anything. <laughs> Sometimes people won't delegate and they micromanage. So there's the lazy problem. There is the micromanage problem. Oops. But also, sometimes they just use the wrong people. I've been in organizations where the boss said, OK, you're in charge of blah, blah, blah. And I think, that person? Are you kidding me? You know, let's pick out the least decisive person in the organization and put them in charge of quick responses. And you just think, and it's not so much like, it's unfair, I wanted that job. I don't want that job, but it's like, that's the worst possible person you can pick. Guaranteed nothing's going to work. That person used to produce reports that had like 47 sections, and there would be arrows in the margins. About, <laughs> well, you know, on the task 33, C, task 27. And you'd look at task 27, there would be one sentence that would say, see above task 15. And <laughs> it was insane. It's like nobody could even decipher this, let alone decide. And, and of course, so the person was in that position for three years, nothing got done except their production of unbelievably confusing reports. Um, <clears throat> But it was all completely predictable. Like, that person? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Well, if you're laundering money, that might be a good thing. That's true. This person would have been fantastic at hiding illegal <laughs> things because nobody could decipher it. Give this to the Treasury Department. They'd be like, what? <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Ah, good. So, yes. Well, not good. That's bad. But, <laughs> but you get the idea. Yeah. Um, look, here's one way in which somebody can be a bad boss. Um, and actually, I think there are several dimensions of what you bring out. One is that it just seems unfair what's going on. Wait a minute. You're doing just as much of a job. You aren't getting that reward, right? So there's, it seems like there's an injustice there. But then there's another factor that gets tied in with the competence issue. It might be you say, wait, I don't see why that person has any greater experience, any greater competence, anything. Notice the respectability. We, I was thinking of that in terms of the person has to be up to a certain minimal level. But actually, there's something more we should say. They should be better at something than you are, right? And if they're not, you're going to think, why are they the boss of me? <laughs> Right? That's what my little brother used to say to me all the time when we were kids. <laughs> You're not the boss of me. And, you know, you could think, well, what? Yeah, why, why are you telling me what to do? I understand this at least as well as you do. So I guess we could say there has to be a position, there has to be a, a greater competence relative to the people working for that person. And if there isn't, so a bad boss, I mean, they don't have to be incompetent, right? They just have to show no greater qualification. No greater qualification, yeah. No greater qualification. You think, well, why, why is that person in charge? And sometimes that's actually tied in with the fairness question. When somebody's appointed to that position, you say, why wasn't it me? Right? I, I'm as good as that person. I know as much as that person. I can do as much as that person. And if they have some skill you don't, 
then you can easily say, okay, I get it. They're a better communicator. Or I understand it. They have a wider range of experience. But if there's nothing like that, you end up thinking, huh, what am I doing working for them? Are there other things that make someone a bad boss? Yeah. So you they can never admit they're wrong? So yeah. So like a good boss is like humble. Maybe you could put it that way. But bad, a bad boss is like, yeah, I'm always right. That's a very interesting question. Yeah. Good. It's a question of taking responsibility. So yeah, some people won't take responsibility. It's always somebody else's fault. And that can be bad, partly because they tend to blame people under them. It's like, oh, yeah, it's not my fault. It's the people who work for me who blew it. But even if they don't blame people they're supposedly leading, you still get the sense, wait, you know, people have to be willing to admit their mistakes. To actually use a Clint Eastwood phrase that captures the Greek virtue of sophrosune very well, they have to know their own limitations. <laughs> And I think that's an important thing, too. There are bad bosses who just don't know their, their own limitations, think they can do things they cannot do. Thinks, they think they know things they don't know. And those are problems. So they won't take responsibility. They don't know their limitations. And that generates all sorts of problems. <clears throat> Anything else about bad bosses? Yeah. There's, it's really ignorant thing. I, yeah, it's tricky. I think I know what you are referring to, but it's a tricky thing to explain because it's not physical distance. Somebody might be a very good boss, even if somebody who's located in another part of the world. You might be sent to Singapore to head up operations there and find you have a great relation with the headquarters in New York or something, so it's not physical distance. It's not really even levels of leadership, though I do think that's relevant. Um, a flatter organization tends to keep people in better communication and tends to keep them knowing things better, tends to make all of this easier to flow through the organization. Um, and yet, you can have lots of levels of hierarchy and still have the people up at the top aware of what's going on and concerned about that. But, but you're right, there's something about that kind of greater hierarchy that makes it more difficult to achieve that. So that's the first point, right? Um, it's, it's like, yeah, it's still possible, but it's a lot harder. It's less likely. But the other thing that you might say is it's a question of emotional distance. How much does that person have an awareness of this, right? I mean, they're, they're, it was common. Well, I shouldn't say that. It was common. Um, there were certain people who were in very, very high positions in the steel industry, for example, who were known for going out on the factory floor, walking through the steel mills as people were pouring steel, making sure that the people who were there in highly dangerous and unpleasant jobs in the mills knew that they were concerned about them. They wanted to see what was going on. And they made it very clear to people, look, I, you'll find me here with the hard hat walking through the mill alongside you kind of like the commander who goes into battle with the troops. Um, even if there are lots of levels of hierarchy, it's very clear that person still got a sense of this. And often in the old days, that was somebody who started out their career on that mill floor. And so there was, there was not that sense of separation. And management was very much aware, we have to make sure there isn't that sense of separation. But today in large companies, there doesn't tend to be that ethic. For one thing, the people at the top usually didn't start down here and work their way up gradually. For another thing, they may have come in from some other industry altogether. It's become common for people at a high level to just come in from a completely different industry. And then you could say, well, wait, this person doesn't actually know what it's like to be. So, so yeah, it's, I guess you could say it's a question of distance, but we have to be it's really not physical distance or even administrative distance. It's more like just a distance of concern, right? How concerned is the person at the top for the conditions of the person who's actually 
on the factory floor or actually shipping the packages or actually interacting with the customers. And they might make sure they keep in contact with that and understand that, but they, they often don't. Anything else? Yes? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, we're running out of room. <laughs> that was pretty short-sighted of me. But, yeah, see, it's always more fun and somehow more fruitful to think about bad than to think about good. Take the negative. But, yeah, um, to be short-sighted. Notice here, a person has to have a vision. But that vision, well, <laughs> if it's not long-term enough, it's, if it doesn't display enough excellence in various ways, it's going to be short-sighted, even if it inspires people temporarily, it's not gonna work out well in the long run. So you want something that actually indicates, look, the boss can think several moves ahead. And if the boss can't do that, then often decisions are gonna be made that might make sense in the immediate context, aren't gonna look very good at all a year from now. And so sometimes, in fact, you'll be in organizations where it seems like, oh yeah, this is great. Then a year or two later, you look at it and say, well, actually, that was, that was not great at all. <laughs> it just seemed great. Uh, Plato stresses the difference between reality and appearance, between what really has a certain quality and what merely appears to. And you want your competence, your vision, your inspiration to be the real thing and not just something that appears to be that way in the short run. Um, uh, I should, uh, maybe we'll end with this thought. A lot of organizations adopt a very short-term strategy. They think, for example, we've got to meet a certain profit goal for this quarter. It's all a three-month driven thing. Or in universities, it's longer term than that because nothing happens in three months. <laughs> but they can think, hey, how long is the average dean or president in that position? Say five to seven years? All their goals are five to seven year goals that are designed to get them their next job. To do something that will make sense for the university over a 20 year period? Ah, they won't be here. And that leads to a kind of short-term mindset that can really damage an organization in the long run. So unless their employees are thinking, well, I'll be here three to five years and I'm moving on, <laughs> um, that can really be frustrating because you end up thinking, yeah, we're making a lot of short-term decisions that make sense in the immediate context, but lead us to these inadequate equilibria that are not going to make any long-term sense. <laughs>